Hey everyone, this is Julia Barbaro, host of the Julia and Gino podcast. I'm here with the co-founder of Jake and Gino, my husband and co-host, Gina Barbaro. Julia, how are you doing, girl? Great. Today's guest is Mark Hart. It's AKA the Bible Geek. Mark is a chief innovation officer at Life Teen International and author of more than 20 books. Most people haven't read 20 books in their lives. He's written more than 20 <laughs> books. That's pretty good, including the best-selling Best Blessed are the Board in Spirit. I love that title. Growing up in a loving Catholic family, he still grew distant from the faith. At 16, a youth minister challenged him to think about some big questions and introduced him to scripture that taught him the true meaning of human dignity. Welcome to the show, Mark Hart. I'm so happy to be here. Are you kidding me? This is great. Mark, I, I, I got to take you to task. <laughs> the book that you wrote, I, I love the book. I read the whole book. My which wife. Book, which book are we talking well, I'm about? Sorry. Which book? Our, not, which of the 20? This one right here. <laughs> I can already see where this is going, you two. I love this. So, I read the book. Which book? <laughs> which book? <laughs> I got a bunch of questions here. She read the book and she goes, You know, the only thing that I remembered out of that book was the story that he talked about when his wife was pregnant. She gave birth and he said his back hurt. I'm like, you're killing me. There's so much wisdom in the book. And that's the only thing you remember. And do you know why? Because I did the same thing on my fifth child. No, we, it was the third. Let's just be clear. Was it the third, third. child I remember? Okay. Well, so tell the story. Give Mark the story in the background, okay? Real quick. Okay. A real quick story was third baby, by the way. Third. Four in the morning, delivered Sophia. Beautiful birth. Everything was incredible. It was at home. Oh, my gosh. It was beautiful. My husband sits back four in the morning and said, I am tired. <laughs> And everyone just looked over and I was like, all right, here now, we Mark, go. Here we go. To my defense, and this is for the men out there because women have no idea. I'm sitting there with no control. I can't help my loving, beautiful wife as she's saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is hard. This is hard. I want to quit. And I'm sitting there and is there so much adrenal stress going on? My cortisol levels. I just feel hopeless and useless. And then it happens. And then after that, you just tend to crash. It's just something unexplainable. So you please defend yourself because it seems I, like I can't defend myself. On, from I, nor, and nor I. I have no, I have no defense. It was, well, a, I, it was, I mean, okay, look, for, okay, first of all, like if, if man is the crown, is, is the crown of creation from Genesis, woman is the crown jewel of creation. Okay. Like, and I think about any of us who have watched our wife go through pregnancy. To watch what happened, like like God's divine design imbued in a woman to watch like, hey, you know, she gets pregnant and just the spleen knows to go up here into the throat and the kidneys go back here into the, to make room to bear life. Okay. Yeah. And, and you have this like this this torment of nine months, the body just in constant duress. And but but and in our defense, men, men, we're we're dumb. We're not we're not smart. Um I mean like in that moment, you're like, I'm holding her hand just you know, like just the bright bright. And when she finally pushes, I mean, and having been having bent over, and I would I'd love to say in my defense, I've been bent over for you know an hour straight, and I, I, I literally I stood up, I was like, oh my back hurts, and I, I as soon as I said it, and you know, you know, said it, but the words escaped, and I think a lot of husbands understand it. So words escape, and you're like, and you go, like, oh, and you put it right back in your mouth as fast as you can, and so instead of looking to the right where my wife was, I looked down to the left where her OB was, and and she looked up and she looks and she goes. No, like, like she's like she's shaking her head like you're a dead man. I was like dead man walking. Like look, we're bringing life and we're taking life. Exactly, it was wonderful. It was, uh, yeah, it was not my best moment, and, and I was so I was so happy to get to share it on the pages of the book. It was when actually uh, when the, when, the, when the publisher came and said, "Do you want to write a book on parenting?" I we I said I started laughing. I'm like literally laughing. I'm like we are, I'm a train wreck. Like I'm my wife is a saint. I'm a hot mess. I have no right to no business writing a book. So I was laughing. I said no. I told them no. And we went out to dinner that night and we had a couple glasses of wine. We were laughing. We were, like, we were like, like, who are we to write a parenting book? Oh my gosh. Like, you know, how about what not to do? And then I kind of looked at her and I started laughing and said, that's what we should do. We should write a book where we share all of our failures and all of our most embarrassing moments. And like, it should be like a what not to do for parents. Like, if we can just share our story, every Catholic parent, every Christian, every parent out there is going to feel like, oh my gosh, we're not that bad. Like, it's great. Like, it, like they're not pole vaulting. They're limboing now. Okay. Mm -hmm. We set the bar so low. That's what it is. <laughs> you know, I, I snow plowed the interview. I didn't mean to start there. I, I really want people no. to get, get to know you a little bit better because you're part of Life Team. You're the chief visionary officer, if I'm not correct. That title doesn't sound like a hot mess to me. That sounds like somebody who's super important. I, I don't well, know. I, <laughs> let me tell you, it's, it's actually chief innovation officer. Very, chief very innovation important. officer. Even <laughs> some, better. Some, some, days, some days I'll get you a cup of coffee if you really like it. No. Um, <laughs> You know, I, uh, I, I, I'm in my uh, 20, uh, 60 years, sorry, before 60 years with Life Team International. And it's been, uh, it's been a, a beautiful and crazy journey. I think I've had like 
six different business cards over you know, the last 26 years. But, um, you know, I think what I, what I love most about Life Team is that, uh, you know, the, the, even though the gospel doesn't change and Christ doesn't change and his teachings don't change, the world changes, right? So how we translate, for lack of a better term, the gospel um, for people, and that's not just for teenagers and preteens, you know, for, for middle schoolers and high schoolers, which we kind of, that's like, that's our, that's our, our, <laughs> that, that's our demo uh, demographic, but how we translate it for parents, but also to help priests and religious and catechists and parents to understand Christ's mercy and God's call for us in the modern age and the screen-based age and a woke culture and everything else, how we translate that in a way that is attractive, that's understandable, that's trans that, that that's transferable and translatable for a parent. Um, that's that's where we that's where we go. That, that that's what we wake up every day to do, you know. And it's a really it's never boring because you know the minute you think like, hey, we got this, this is great. Then a new platform starts, um, a, a new social media thing starts, something else goes wrong, the world blows up, pandemics happen, whatever. And uh, so it's like every time you think you got a beat, um, something else comes up, you know. So it's uh it's never boring. Uh, it's never ever boring, but it's it's a beautiful challenge, and it's really it gets me. I, I get excited. Like every morning, I wake up, I'm excited to figure out like how can we explain and share and translate God's love today to a modern 21st century teenager and their family. Yeah, that's beautiful. I have to say, you sound like you were talking about just raising a family at the, at that moment because that's kind of how I wake up in a sense. It's like, how do I even get through this day? Obviously, through a lot of prayer. Um, but I just can I just go back to the original story that you guys were talking about because yeah. I have to say something nice about you. I just I can't help it. Something sorry. nice. Wow. <laughs> Everybody, make sure you turn up the volume because okay. now we're going to say something nice. So make sure you get just the dialogue. Just for a second. Okay. So. I run a women's group through Jake and Gino, which is Gino's edu uh, real estate education company. Women, beautiful women. We get on. We talk about struggles. We, and this topic actually came up once. And a lot of the women were complaining about the husbands. I can't believe you did this. That, but the other thing. And I said, ladies, you know, I just had this new discovery recently. And it was after we had children. Obviously, our youngest is, is eight now. And I realized that you men feel, just like Gino said, 100% helpless. And I actually had compassion for you for a second and for I, a second and yeah, I, I did and I talked with these women and some of them were like oh I never thought about it that way and it was so it was so beautiful for a second to speak with just women on this on this call about the other side because a lot of times yep. we only see our side so there's I'm so glad that that, that that's actually, that's awesome I'm so glad you said there's so much wisdom in that it um you know it's like for for the for the male who thinks he's in charge which we all know we're not and um, who want, want to be holy, and most of us we, we pale in comparison. I think that's why I think that's why God gives us the holy family, like because as holy as Saint Joseph is, he's not the immaculate virgin. Um, so you're constantly like with your spouse in awe because your spouse is holier than you. It's very humbling. You know? But I think for most of us, we want to be hunter, gatherer, provider. We want to be like the strong one, be the spiritual head, all these things. I think you get in this moment where. Um, where like your most the most important person in your world is compromised and you're having to rely on everybody else you know, i mean unless you are the ob like you're having to rely on everybody else you know and it's just this it's this very humbling moment where you realize as even if i can control everything else in the known universe and provide and love and and try and care for that you're just completely helpless and, and you realize like not only that you're helpless like to help the one you love the most but also this new life is coming and it's really humbling. And it's really, um, it, I think it's it's one of these one of those. If, if a couple's blessed to have a child or multiple, it's one of those moments where God really, like, like the divine, really meets the human, and God really reaches down and He reminds you, like you can be financially successful, you can be professionally successful, you can be emotionally, relationally, you can be successful in every other way, but you still need me. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm going to remind you of that. And now, and it's, 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 and again, it's like the precursor because now I'm going to remind you of that every single day for the next 18, 20, 40 years of their life, you know, and then we're going to do it multiple times. So it's like, even if you think you have a kid or two, you think you got it wired, you think you got it figured out, and God says, no, we're going to do this again because you still haven't figured it out because you still need me. And, and you're still, you know, it's like, okay, oh, now they're out of the diapers and you think you got it figured out, you've got like this, you know, tag team thing or you go to zone defense. Now I'm going to send you another kid because you still haven't figured it out. I really think for those of us that have more than one kid, it's because we're that we're that we're that stubborn. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm just gonna keep sending you saint making machines until you figure it out. You know? 
<laughs> I love in the book when you when you, when you said about Saint Joseph. For all the dads out there, can you imagine being you know Joseph? Your your son is God, and, and your 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 wife has no sin. I mean, basically, you're, you are literally you are Mrs. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally, Mrs. Right. right. She's never <laughs> sinned. <laughs> I, I always, I, I, I picture, I did a, I did a, uh, I did a stand up routine years ago. I did like a whole 10 minute riff on St. Joseph. And, and I was, I was, I was like, can you imagine St. Joseph trying to teach Jesus how to fish? I mean, like, <laughs> poor Joseph. He's like, he's like, Hey son, come over here. Like, and, and Jesus is like, Oh dad, they're over there. They're over there. Dad. <laughs> not, not even close pops. You know what I mean? Like it's just so embarrassing. Right. Right. Like, I just like I, I so St. Joseph and I we go we go on runs we go on long walks he and I talk daily because he's just Joe like, he, I'm like dude just help me man just help, pray for me give me wisdom it's like being married to like literally a saint and like that like the, 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 she's literally the only Mrs. Right in history she was never wrong right that's that's a that's a way to wake up with how you how, how you teach your kid how you teach him how to pray yeah good luck Joe anyway he's God I love him. <laughs> I mean, Jill, I want to jump into the book a little God, bit. Yes, I, I that's think fine. The book yeah, is great. I, I, I mean, you talk fine. about family of origin yeah. question, parenting style. I love even intimacy and passion. You said the definitions and how society's co-opted them. Let's just start with there. You talk mm -hmm. about intimacy, intimacy and passion in, 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 a, in a relationship and marriage. Yeah. You know, um, it's so sad. I mean, when you say the word intimacy now, it conjures up, you know, hey, are we, are we buying adult toys? Are we watching adult movies? Are we? And, and that's just like what, where culture's gone with it. And we have a... a, a really counterfeit concept of what intimacy is. And if you go back, I'm a huge word nerd. I love words. Um, you go back to etymo uh, the etymology of intimacy, it actually means um, to make the innermost known, right? So, mm -hmm. so true intimacy in its, in its proper context and understanding is like, how can I make the, 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 the deepest longings, yearnings, moanings, achings of my heart and soul known to another, right? Um, and so for most of us, um, that's through the context of marriage, right? Like that there's this one person who has chosen through the covenant and sacrament to put up with me until God calls me home. Um, and how can I make the innermost fears that I have, uh, desires that I have, uh, longings, all this, how can I verbally, physically uh, make those known, share those with another soul and trust those to another soul? And that's what true intimacy is. And that's really where, I think that's really where what separates a a, a, a contract marriage to a covenant marriage, like a good marriage to a great marriage is the, the degree to which the spouse is willing to entrust their deepest longings and fears to another. And it's, you know, marriage is like the divine merge lane, right? But the two don't become one easily. Like when you, I mean, whenever you're merging, especially when you're in heavy traffic, it's like, it's always like this game of someone's got to give, right? Someone's got to give as the two lanes are going into one. And usually it's like, it's like, Oh, if I, if, 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 I don't give, like <laughs> I won, and if I give, well, now I'm pissed at the person in front of me, right? Now the driver. And marriage is the exact opposite. It's really like I should seek to, I, I, I should seek to want to give. I, I, I want the the best for the other, right? Not for myself. And it's not self seeking. It's it's selfless, as, as Pope Saint John Paul II wrote about extensively in Theology of Mind. It's self gift. And I think that's what's what's so hard is that that true intimacy only comes through true humility. And, and through true transparency and humility and transparency in a, in a, in a YouTube selfie culture uh, are really, really hard to come by, right? Because everyone's kind of trying to get their own and trying to carve out their own space. And, mm -hmm. and it's almost seen as a sign, it's almost seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, but we know in marriage is that what, what is seen by the world as a weakness in marriage is just is meekness and is humility. You know? So um, I think that the, the, the marriages that I see that I, uh, admire that we try to emulate are those ones who just live in such transparency and such awe of the other such awe of i'm 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 so blessed that i get to call i get to call you mine that i get to uh fall asleep next to you that i get to live this 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 joyful mess of a life with you um that's a that's a gift you know that's a true gift and i think um i think what's hard is that for couples who don't have that um they either quit or they just say, I'm never going to have it. And they kind of go live two separate lives and then never merge. But I think what I'm always trying to say to people is, listen, I don't, I don't care if you've been married for a year or 40 years. Like, if you don't have that, you still can. But it's going to begin with two words. And that's I'm sorry. And then it's going to begin with three words, God help me. 
you know, it, because it's never, it's never too late. Cause if, if you are married and there's, there's a grace there and the grace of the sacrament is always stronger than we are because grace is a real thing and it's a tangible thing. And we have to, it's like, grace is like a powder keg and we have to tap into it, but you have to be careful because the minute you tap into it, you can't control it. And I think mm -hmm. that's where most of us go wrong is we want to control. And the minute we're willing to say, I'm going to tap into it and God, your will be done. Well, buckle, buckle up, man. Because you, you ain't on the, you ain't on the, the merry go round anymore. Like you're on, you're on the roller coaster. You know what I mean? And it's a beautiful, fun, exhilarating ride. And God only knows how long it goes, but it's, it's worth the ride. Mark, I would let my wife ask you a question about the book, but all she can remember is the first story. So I just, I, 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 I can't know, go to her. I don't know. All she remembers is the first story. Hey, 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 look, it's the bus driver. He's rolling over the bus again. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Before you jump on a question, I'm going to ask Mark another question yeah. in the book, and then I'll let you go. Because I can go see your eyes it. glazing I'm good. over and going, I'm good. Okay. Go for it. Why, do, why don't people work harder on prayer life? I, I love that because I think let's talk about prayer life because prayer life is so important. Even five minutes, carving out five minutes to spend time with Jesus, with the Lord, or, or praying to Mary. Why don't people work harder on prayer life? I I think ultimately it's because um, we have a we have a pretty jacked up concept of what prayer is. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's because of bad preaching. I don't know if it's because of, you know, um, self-help books. I don't I mean, I'm not blaming Oprah. She's wonderful. You're a nineties yeah, guy, by the way, jacked up. And I, I haven't heard that word jacked up in a while. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. You said that. No. Yeah. 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 I just, I, you know, people have this, this mistaken notion that like, well, prayer helps your relationship with God. Like, no, prayer is your relationship with God. It doesn't help it. Prayer is it. If you're not praying, you don't have a relationship. Like that's, I mean, it, it, um, you know, I can, I can sit all day in a garage. It doesn't make me a mechanic, right? Like, you, like, just like going to church doesn't make you holy. You have to have a prayer life. A prayer, church, going to church can actually help you for sure. I mean, it should. It should. I mean, I mean even, hey, even, if, even if mass is terrible, I mean, I've sat there and prayed that the homily would end. It still gets me to pray. I mean, like, right? So, I mean, it still gets, it's still helpful. Um, but I think that, I think most people that don't work in their prayer life because it just isn't a priority. Like, we, we want, we want God when we have a family member dying in a hospital bed and our knees fall on a cold marble floor in a non-denominational chapel of a hospital, we want God to be there. But it's almost like it takes those moments for a lot of us to really take prayer seriously. Um, and we kind of forget the prayer, the praise, the thanksgiving, the adoration. We forget the parts like, it's a sunny day and there's money in the account and our kids are healthy. Well, then why the hell aren't you praying? Like, why aren't you stopping to, to acknowledge your blessings and to acknowledge the God who at this point is bestowed upon you? And that's where you strengthen that relationship. That's where the trust grows. That's where the intimacy grows with God. Because some, because you know what? In a, in a month or a year, maybe the funds aren't going to be in the account and someone is going to be in a bed and your kids aren't going to be okay. And you know what? Like, it is. It's, it's the, that's like how you use like the roller coaster analogy. Like, I think that most of us as Christians, we say we want the roller coaster. We say we want like a Holy Spirit driven life. But the reality is we want the merry-go-round. We want it nice and easy and clean and safe and controlled so that, so that you know, we can get on and get off and we can do our thing. Oh, look, oh, the horse is going up and down. Always in this time. Versus like you get in the car, the roller coaster, you put down the, you put down the harness, you put your hands in the air and you say, God, take me where you want to take me, you know? And, and I think uh, that's the hard part because it, because ultimately 99% of us are control freaks and the other, the other 1% are liars. Like they are too, you know. <laughs> Julia, I lied because I said two more comments. You're letting One me comment. practice my patience. Yes, so exactly. I'm yes, because you know, I just uh, you wrote in the book, "Lord, grant me the desire to pray more." I think that's what we should all say. Lord, grant me the desire to pray more. And you had a story, a great story about your kids when they were, were praying with you. And you're like, Jesus, you rock. Amen. They bolted out. And the intention was there. I, I, I love that. Can you share that story with the listeners? Yeah. Well, you, know, I was, you know, I think it's so hard. You know, when you're, when you're, oh, I want to raise a good holy family. You know, whether it's a good holy Catholic family, <laughs> Christian family. And you know, and having these grandiose plans like in your head, you're like, you, know, you, wanna, you want your kids to be better than you. You want your kids to be holier than you. You want your kids to know the Lord better than you know him, you know? And so, you know, so we, we take, we take, you know, grace before meals and mass course, but we take night prayer very seriously. You know, we sit down with our kids, especially when they're littles and we want to get them into a rhythm of prayer where they, where they, where they know every night, this is how you're going to end your day, but also just how to address the Lord, you know, and, and obviously you want there to be reverence and, and, and awe and respect. Um, so like for me, you know, we're, we're praying the prayer, you know, and, 
and you know, and we would take turns leading it, you know. And, and at the time, my daughter's just like, you know, she's praying, and, and she's just Jesus, you rock, Amen. She, she bolted. She wanted to go play. She wanted to go watch your show or whatever. She was like, okay, and she read the room right. I mean, she knew how to manipulate dad. And so it was like, Jesus, you rock, Amen. And I kind of recalled the couch and look at my wife. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm a failure. I suck. Like we're two terrible parents. Like that's what she had. Like, and then the more we kind of, I, I kind of sat with it and reflected on it. I'm like. Well, what was I wanting? Was I wanting her to pray like a, a rosary backwards in Latin on her knees? Like, what was I really, what am I going for here? Do I want her to know the Lord or know prayers, you know? And, and I think what I kind of arrived to, we arrived to was just like, she, she felt so comfortable and, and, and the Lord was so relatable and Christ was so real, you know what I mean? In her, like, in, mm-hmm. like, in her family, you know, and I'm like, well, that, but that's ultimately what we're going for. You know, like for them to talk about Jesus as though he's sitting right with us at the dinner table, you know, let me talk about their day. Like, Hey, he's totally in the car. You know what I mean? Like he's just, he's right here along with me. You know, it's not even like for them, it's not even a question. Is God real or can I trust God? It's more about like, Oh, he's there. He's right here. He, he hasn't said anything. You know, I think that's what you want to get to. Like remember, like we always talk about in the gospels, like the storm at sea, Jesus is walking on the water. Powerful. Matthew 14. It's a beautiful story. We don't often talk about the first storm at sea where Jesus is asleep in the boat, right? So here they are, and storm kicks up. These are professional sailors, right? But they're freaked out. But that tells us something about the storm, okay? Like it's this is not a little this is not like a, like a little mild front. It's scary enough that professional sailors who work the water every single day are freaked out, and they're shrieking and they're calling out in terror. And Jesus, it's not like God's band. Like God isn't he, like not like in the walk in the water. In the walk in the water, he wasn't in the boat. He was up on the mountain praying. He has to come out to them. This one, he's literally in the stern. He's asleep on a cushion, right? And, and like it, it kind of reminds me, like God's right there. Now he might not, he might not rebuke the wind. He might not act on your schedule, respond as fast as you want or the way you want. But he's right there, you know. And when my when my daughter said like Jesus, you know, like God, you rock, Amen. And she bolted. I'm like, you know, it's like she knows he's here. And that's, I'm like, ultimately, isn't that what you want as a parent? You want your kids to know when the storms come, which they will, whether that's in, you know, in junior high, in high school, college, marriage, with work, with whatever, you know, um, hey, you know, when, when we were at, when we're in hospice, well, we're in a, at a hospital bed and they're, they're crying out to heaven. You want them to know God's here. He's here, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's the way that, that's the way that you and I, like as parents, that's the way we live on. That's the way that our life echoes long after we're in the ground is is through the faith is if if the faith that we've tried our best to instill in them is still with them and carrying them long after we're gone physically and we're only here spiritually Mm -hmm. no i love that i love that and i think that's one of our difficulties as parents is that we want to do it so perfectly for our kids we want to be their example we want to teach them so well and when they don't do something then they're like oh my gosh we, we messed up, we screwed up. And, and it's, it's one of those things where I think it's hard for us, especially we're talking about the birthing. I don't know why this keeps coming up, but you guys, and, and, and the let during the go, birth, but to go. let go. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> to let go of that control that we actually don't have anyway, it, you know, and to give it to God and say, I, I can't do it I, because I, I don't have the control there. All I can do is control what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, my actions. I can't control what's going on in front of me. And it's so challenging as a parent, especially with your kids when they do things out and you're so embarrassed because everyone's looking at you. Mark's got a story yes. for that one. It'll, and so it'll... it's, it's, but it's incredible <laughs> once you figure it out to let go, it's so freeing. Tell and everyone, I just wish people share, would know how the free it story. was. The Lent story is just phenomenal because I mean that oh, I, I, I love that one because it's like I don't think we've done it. Oh, is this? Bad. Oh, oh, you mean for me from Ash Wednesday? Yeah, Ash Wednesday. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, you'll notice when you read the book, um, "Our Not Quite Holy Family." I don't use any of the kids' names. I just say at the time our nine-year-old or this daughter, and, um, because I don't want to publicly shame any of them. Although. Most of the stories can be attributed to the same kid. They uh, probably the shamed you. Which is, this is the irony, <laughs> oh, yeah, so right? Yeah. I, 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 I used to have a sea of dark hair. I used to have hair. I mean, I used to have a sea of dark hair. Uh, and then she came along. But um, <laughs> no, it, it, was, it, was, it was one specific Ash Wednesday. And we, uh, our girls are, uh, they're very girly girls. They're just, they're just, they're very, very girly girls. I uh, like their mom. And um, so we're at Ash Wednesday Mass. And we're going forward to receive ashes. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. You know, the priests, the deacons, the ministers out there, just ministering ashes. And we're going forward. It's just a typical, it's just a typical Ash Wednesday. It's not a big deal. It's, it was just, it was a very uh, unmemorable Ash Wednesday, right? It was like I don't remember the readings, I remember the homilies, the ashes. 
And as we get up, my, my, other, my other kids go get ashes. And then my, uh, now I'm going to say specifically third daughter. Um, she's walking up and she's there in like her little like fake high heels and her little dress and little shirt. She looked really cute. Hair all done. But I mean, she, as, as she's walking up, she's, she's seeing what's happening and she's young. This one, she's, you know, she's young. And she's starting to do the math in her head like, they're going to put that crap on my face. Like, they put that dirt on my face. And she's like, uh uh-uh. uh, like, no, not going to happen. So she gets up there. I mean, and she was right in front of me. But as like, I remember, like, she was, she, everyone else was walking forward, like, normal pace. And she kind of started pausing more and more and stopping more and more. Like, she was doing the math, like, how can I get out of here? And so she gets up there, it's her turn to see the ashes. And they go in and give her the ashes. And she, like, she dodges. She, like, she bolts to the right. And then the person that visibly, they got to go and she bolts to the left. And I'm like, oh, good God, I see where this is going. And I'm just mortified. It's like the bad Catholic dad behind her. Like, this is so embarrassing. And finally, they go in, they right in front of her forehead. She just, like, just subconsciously, automatically just reacts, reaches out and just smacks the hand, smacks the bowl. It goes flying, ashes asunder. And I'm just like, holy crap, we have to change churches. Like, the hearts cannot come back. Like, we're the worst parents in the history of the world. And of course, my wife, what does she do? She starts walking faster, right back to the field. Like, hey, get, 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 get a hold of your kid, buddy. Get a hold of your kid, buddy. Like, who's that? Who's, who's that? who's that terrible parent? I'm just like, oh. She was getting you back. She was getting you she back. She absolutely back, was. Yeah. We've had so many moments. I mean, I, I had I had one point years ago that, that literally the former pastor, who was a good, dear friend of mine, literally looked, like, looked, looked over to where we sat and he shushed our section because we because our kids were talking. Like, he shushed us in the middle of mass. He's looking at me, he's like, you know, I'm just like, hey, we're the heart, we're a mess. Hey, we're we're here. Thanks. First, we'd have our Irish priest say I, it was Cecilio. That's, <laughs> that's it. I'm reading this book, and I'm so thankful that you had to go through all this, and, and we did it yet. So thank you, Mark. I told you, hey, lowering the bar, everybody. Don't no need a pole vault, just limbo. Your, your, okay. your book is only 130 pages. Our book would be 300 pages. Our book. Like, oh, oh, oh no, 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 no. no it's, I don't. It's, a, it's 130 pages of what we're allowed to publish. They share the other stuff. We have our kids in therapy until they're eighty. Okay, if they, if they remembered it. I'm hoping they forget. So. Yeah, I love that. No, I, I love that you share. I'm curious. You do work with your wife. Your kids are obviously involved. You're sharing stories about you know their childhood, your parenting skills. Because I just realized that this morning when my daughter's trying to watch one of our podcasts, I'm like, should she know all this? <laughs> like, I don't know if this is okay. Well, this is okay. Yeah. What is your view on that? Tell me I, about um, that. Tell me about the dynamics between, you know, you, your wife working together, your, your kids, your kids are involved. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Um, our oldest uh, is about to turn 21 and she's on core at our parish. She's on core for life team. Um, so she, she is a leader for high schoolers. Then we have two in high school and life team. But one of them is actually on core for the middle school program. So like, they're, they're very, very involved, very integrated in parish. I'm very proud of their amazing girls. Um, and we have, then we have the dude. We only have one boy in his last season of high school. Um, I think working I, in terms of transparency and what you share, um, I think that's I mean, that's that's been different for every couple. You know, we have we have brokenness that we'll share on the couch with them because we want to model. Um, you know, hey, this the, that marriage is, is hard. The marriage is work. The marriage takes a lot of a lot of uh, humility and, and give and take and a lot of conversation. And then obviously, there's there's topics and situations that are only discussed. You know, behind closed doors in the bedroom when the kids are out. That kind of thing. And I think that that's pretty much common sense, but. I think for us, we, our, our kind of hard and fast rule is um, if it's something that's a deep wound in the marriage or something that we're still working through or that, that comes up and working through, we don't work through it in front of the kids, right? If it's something that's like, hey, we, we, we know the right answer. This is a good learning lesson, a good life moment, you know, and they can see, you know, you know kids always like, if, if you're fighting or if there's, if, there's, if there's tension, they can tell. You know, and I think that I think there is a, there is a healthiness there for parents to be like, hey, you know, like, like, like my wife is like, I'm not very happy with your father right now. You know what I mean? And 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 I think she'll acknowledge it. She'll call it out. And as humbling as that is, as the dad, that also puts me in notice and gives me the opportunity to say, yeah, you know what? Dad was bonehead. Dad, dad was stupid. And I and I didn't react to this the right way. And mom has a right to be mad at me. And and to be able to air that out in a way where they can kind of see the conversation you know, and then she, and, and that, that allows her to work off of hopefully humility on my part, right? Where can turn her heart. It gives them a, a, a visible example of, of, of conflict resolution. You know what I mean? Because anytime a couple says, oh, we never fight. We never fight. That, that's, a, that's a flag for me. That, that was kind of worries me when the couple says, I don't fight. And I'm not saying that couples, you, you should go, you're a bad couple. I'm not saying that. But that, that sometimes, sometimes what that signals to me is 
there's probably a lot of unresolved things that are kind of lying in wait and building up. And, and, and if that happens, then resentment builds up. And if that happens, then that thing's going to explode at some point. And it's not going to be good. Um, so I think that it's like, it's like, it's like a, um, if you like an Instapot like, or a pressure cooker, you know what I mean? Like, like once it hits the thing, the pressure has to release or you have to hit the thing and let the pressure release. You have to, you know? So I think there's a healthiness in that. Um, so, so we have kind of like, we have a rule like, Hey, you know, if, if, if we know we're going to be good, we're just kind of working through the thing, we can bring the kids into it. And that, that offers an opportunity for me to say, I want to be like for my daughter specifically, like, I want to be, I want to model for you the guy I want you to bring home. Do you know what I mean? I want to model for mm-hmm. you the guy I want to have for your hand. Um, and that's a challenge. You know, and that, and that, it's a lot of, I mean, I've swallowed a lot of volleyballs at pride. I mean, wow, a lot. Um, but it was funny, like you mentioned, like working together. Um, so my wife, um, you know, we're, we're blessed. She's a stay-at-home mom. Uh, she has been for, for 20 years. And um, and that's just, it's a, be- it's a beautiful, wonderful vocation that she embraces. And, and that's just kind of what we decided for our family. But um, we've, we've done three um, books together now, not because we haven't figured out. What was funny was <clears throat> the first time we were going to write a book, um, we sat down to write it. We got into a fight. And it took like a couple of days, like for it to really get back to. We sat down again, second time, got in a fight again. <laughs> and we were sitting in our prayer room, like and we're, we're arguing, like and then, like we're supposed to be like writing this book about marriage. It was just, you know, and and then we started like we actually got to and, like started laughing, and we prayed. And we're like, you know what? This is a really good sign. This is a really good sign. Like this is like if if the devil attacks you that fast, you know I mean, like then then you got something that the Lord wants to share. You know, it says in Romans seven twenty one, it says, when you seek to do good, evil will be at hand. Right. When you seek to do good, evil will be at hand. So I, I always say to a couple like, hey, you know what? Like, um, if you're trying, I mean, if you're really trying, like, here, here you are, look like this. You did a, like, you don't have to do a podcast. It's not like you're looking for more work, right? You're like, no, like, we felt called to do it. It takes a lot of work. You, 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 I mean, and not just like the equipment, the time, the schedule. It takes work. You still have to communicate, you got to figure it out. And I'm sure it's not always like just beautiful and perfect behind the scenes and beautiful and perfect when you're doing it. Like, it's going to take work. And, and, it's like the minute you say we want to do something that's going to bless people or that's going to bring the kingdom to fruition or that's going to share the gospel, you're basically painting a big bullseye on your back. And, and you don't even have, to, you don't have to have a podcast or be on stage to do that. Any couple who's trying to live a holy life and trying to raise holy kids, you're, you've painted a bullseye on your back. Okay? And that's why um, Venerable Fulton Sheen said, and he, wrote, I mean, he wrote an amazing book. The best book I've ever read about marriage is called Three to Get Married. And it's this concept of marriage, like the Trinity, is one plus one plus one equals one, right? So it takes the husband and the wife and God. This isn't Ecclesiastes 4. It's a three-ply cord that's not easily broken. If you have the man and the woman and God, that's when it's a true sacrament. And I think that's, that's what's sorely lacking in so many marriages where people feel like we're good but not great, or it's okay but not good is that a lot of times we're missing the God aspect. We're missing the God part of the three-ply cord. A two-ply cord, you can pull right apart. A three-ply cord, give it your best shot, it's not going to happen. And that's why the one plus one plus one equals one is this divine sacramental math. And the more that we remember that third person in the marriage, the stronger the marriage is. Mark, that explains why this podcast almost not got started. You see how my wife is laughing? She already knows where I'm going. It's pretty good that uh, you can feel me, baby. You feel the energy. I, I, come, yeah. I can read so your mind. We're yes. in my mom's basement about four years ago, and it was our second interview. And I said something that I probably shouldn't have said. I called her really lazy when we got married. I didn't mean it that way. And I always have to like back it up by saying, oh, time out. It's because you know now you've got six kids. You do four loads of laundry. You're still. I, like you're still, still, I, still, I feel like you're still defending yes, yourself. Yes, I'm still trying okay. to defend right. myself. It's okay. But it, it's yeah. really funny how Mark said it. I We're trying to do something really good. And, yeah. and the way I help. Amazing. Because yeah. we actually fought just like you guys yes. did for two days. And I'm like, forget it. We're not doing it. <laughs> and it was over. 100% done. And then I'm like, well, that's dumb of us. That's childish of us. And we did it. And I, and I got to tell you, I love what you said because we have helped in a sense or assisted in helping so many marriages through just this. Mm-hmm. And I have these women, uh, women's groups that we have through it. And I just think about that sometimes. All the things people would have missed out on, I would have missed out on. And I just encourage everyone listening, if there's something like Mark said, if you, if there's, you have a call to do something, yes, it might be difficult, but just keep going. Mm-hmm. My gosh. I mean, honestly, you know? if, if, if only the, if only like the, the qualified and holy people did stuff, there wouldn't be anything. Okay. Like <laughs> it, 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 think, about, think about this way. Okay. So God looks down and goes, who should lead the Israelites out of Egypt? You got Aaron, the dude's a priest and he's very, he's, he's eloquent. And he goes, nah, 
I want his brother, the stuttering murderer. Okay, and you're like, wait, 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 no, 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 you got Aaron, he's a priest, he can preach. No, 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 no. I want the stuttering murderer. Like, you know, how about the New Testament? Yes, Stephen. Okay, first deacon. So in love with God as he's being stoned to death. He's forgiving people and still preaching. He's still preaching a sermon. Hey, he should be the leader of the church. And he's like, no, too obvious. Give me Saul. Give me the guy who's handing people the rocks. I'm like, if you're waiting to be perfect, <laughs> you're going to be waiting a long time. Get out there and do something, man. It's just me. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> I love it. I love that. This is so awesome. No, really. It's funny because we actually were at the president's gathering a couple of weeks ago with you. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't officially meet you, which, but here we are. And you told a couple of the stories, especially about the, the parade with God, having God that third in your marriage. And I was like, man, we got to get that on. How am I going to get that message out? And here we are. <laughs> So I, I just, I just think well, I should because the first, the first time I tried braiding my daughter's hair, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just like wrapping, I'm just it, wrapping straight. I, mean, I came from family with boys, you know, wrapping yes. them up. And my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, how am I supposed to know how to do that? I came from a family of boys. I'm just, you know, just, I'm just tying knots, you know, just, uh, I, I think, I think she's still getting knots out 10 years later, 15 years later. But, yeah. <laughs> Mark. Just tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you, work, work with the work with life team and where they can learn more about what you're doing, buying your books. Just give me a couple of places where people can yeah, get yeah, more sure. information about uh, you. So life team. So we, um, we're, we're, we're in our 38th year, uh, I'm blessed to say, um, it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey. So we exist to help, to help parishes do a better job. Parishes and parents do a better job reaching out to today's teenagers. So we have summer camps, we have training conferences, we have youth conferences, we have resources. Um, so basically the idea is that we exist to create resources for parishes so that priests and religious and youth ministers um, don't have to do all that heavy lifting. Don't have to figure out how to write a teaching or pull off a video. They can just spend time because it's, it's about relational ministry. You spend time with young people. That's going to change their life. Um, so you, you visit lifeteam.com. You can see uh, we're all over the world. We're in 26 countries. We're all across the U.S. Um, parishes, big and small, urban and rural, um, suburban. Uh, so there, there's there's training opportunities. If you're a parent, say you're a volunteer, you want to volunteer with your youth group. And you're like, I don't know anything about teenagers. We're here to help you. Um, we'll, we'll translate the gospel for you and help you do it. And then in terms of just me, you can find me um, on Facebook. It's just Mark Hart, the Bible Geek. Uh, you can find me at BibleGeek.com. Um, I do a, uh, for life, can do a weekly video, uh, about a six minute video reflection called Summit. You can find it on YouTube. That's just about the weekly readings. Um, just to kind of help, just to help connect the dots because you don't really understand the backstory of the reading. Sometimes you can walk in and then your whole first half of mass is all dependent upon whether or not the preaching is good and the hallway is good. And that's a pretty tall mm -hmm. order. That's, that's a lot to put on our guys. Uh, and then if you're looking for books, um, if you're looking for uh, something to help put you to sleep at night, go to amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just type in my name. Uh, and uh, I've, I, uh, over the last, uh, last, I don't know, 20 years, um, done a lot of different books just for, uh, I mean, every, Every different audience, Catholic, every different Catholic audience, young and old, uh, different topics. And then um, I also have, uh, I've, I've been really blessed. I have a great relationship with Ascension Press. They do wonderful stuff for the church. Uh, people probably are familiar with Father Mike Schmitz and his Bible in the Year. He's a, he's a good friend. Um, so I've done several different video series, which you can watch online or DVD series. If you want to just dive deeper into scripture, dive deeper into the mass, uh, evangelization, that kind of a thing. So I, uh, I really, uh, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I get to do a lot of different things. I'm really, I'm, I'm like the most blessed man on the planet. It's amazing. Mark, I should have asked this question before. And because I think for us, life teams is transformational for our kids. Our oldest kid is Gabriella. She's, she's working at, at, at Cove Crest right now. My son's going back for the right. summer. My two younger kids are going to camp. They went to camp last year. Why should parents send their kids? To, I mean, I, I can answer it real quick, but I'd like to hear your story. You need to have your kids involved in the faith early on. So when they go to college, they have that faith in ground in them and they don't leave the church. Can you expand upon that and tell the parents out there, listen, this has been an amazing journey for my family, for the Barbaros and for everyone who's part of Life Team. If you want to continue the tradition of handing down faith to, to your children, because that's really important before we wrap the show up. I yeah. want parents listening out there just to say, hey, this is a great, great, I guess, gift to gift children. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Moses in Deuteronomy before he dies, he says something. Oh, he says a lot of profound stuff. But he says something very profound. This is this is wisdom from thirty six hundred years ago. Um, he says, uh, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength." And then he says these words in Deuteronomy six. He says, "Drill this into your children. Speak about it whether you're at work or at rest, whether you're at home or whether you're away. Like drill these words into your children." Okay, write them, put them as a, as a pendant on your forehead, 
uh, uh, and put it on the doorpost of your house. Like basically what Moses is saying is your success, if God sends you kids, if he chooses to send you children, your success will not be judged by what's in your will. Your success will be judged by if you introduce them to the father's will. So you can die penniless, but you will be heralded as a saint in heaven if your kids know God and if they love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. The reason that I would advocate for any parent and say, yes, please send your kids to camp um, is not because we need more kids to go to camp. We have, we have a wait list. Like we're trying to build more camps, to be honest, like because there's such a need. But if you spend time with a modern teenager, and I mean really spend time with a preteen, middle school, or high school, if you really spend time with a modern teenager, I just want to say to parents, you have to let go of the concept of what you remember from your teenage years, of what teenage life was like, okay? Before social media, before everyone had a smartphone, I mean, like, but you have, before we were such a woke culture, you have to let go of everything that you remember from your adolescent years. Yes, desires are still the same as when you were a teenager, but the, but the playing board has changed dramatically and it continues to change. If you, if you really want to do something amazing for your kids, send them like to a, a, a camp. Like we have, we'll, we'll do three day conferences, youth conferences, and they're great, but you can only do so much in 48 hours. To send your child away to the beauty of Korean days with a, with a parish, the group of like-minded, like-hearted kids, with, with leaders who know what they're doing, with, with speakers and musicians and, and priests who know what they're doing and they've been trained to do it, um, to give them that, not just the gift of freedom from their devices, um, but to reintroduce them to the creator in creation and to allow them to understand um, not just foster community, but to have time to listen, to really listen and not be distracted. I've never seen a kid go through a week of camp and not walk out stronger, better, and more assured that there is a God and he knows them and he loves them. It's so transformative that literally once a kid goes through camp, well, all they want to do when they get into college is come back to camp as a leader. I mean, it's, and, it's, and this is not this fanciful parent draft summer camp. Look, we have archery. There's a lot of fun stuff. But it's because when they walk onto that ground, it's holy ground. You know, when they leave, it's, it, they, they view it as holy ground. That, that field where they had messy games, um, that, that creek, you know, that waterfall, that, that the rapids, the blob in the lake, like, those, are, those are like cathedrals in a teenage mind because this is where they've experienced God in a profound way. And they know maybe for the first time in their 12 or 16-year-old life that God is real. And for any of us, if we didn't have that, we can all probably go back to that first moment that you remembered spirit, you know, hearing the voice of God, experiencing the reality of God. Like we can all go back to that moment where like, we know God is real and it's profound, it has a profound impact. And we have seen such a transformation in the last 20 years of camps. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, the vocations, the holy marriages that have come out of these weeks of camp, the, the stories are too many. They're too numerous to tell. But they're they're legit and they're tangible, and that, I mean, as evidenced by your family, like the fact that you have, you have that your kids are all they're like they're heading back. It's once once you get into that uh, mindset, it's sort of like it's not even a question. Like I'll build my summer job, I'll build my everything around this, because even if all heck broke loose in my semesters, I know like, this is this is my due north. Like this is where I'm anchored, and I know that when I go there, I know that God is there, and I know that the people around there are like minded, like hearted, and I know I'm loved. And what a what a beautiful testament in the middle of this culture we're living in to know there's a place like that. We should we should all be so lucky. I've I've been been advocating. We need to have adult camps. We really do. (laughs) Just please, we're all going to kill, right? (laughs) Julia, take us home. No, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that you joined us because your message is absolutely incredible. And um, I just want to thank you for putting yourself out there and 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 sharing this with other people. You know, you you bring your family in and you're teaching about how to have a, a holy family. I know that's not the book, but because it's a struggle and it takes a lot of effort. And I know the two of you men, especially, you know, you're, you have a huge challenge ahead of you. You know, I feel like us women, we're, we're okay. <laughs> Not, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know I, what I'm I talking about. Know. You have a bigger challenge <laughs> in my, in my view anyway. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, and just encourage all the men out there to, to be like, Mark and Gino. Mark, oh, thank you. And way higher. Way higher. <laughs> you know what you I mean are, by that. You two are, no, I know. You two are tremendous. I'm so glad you're doing this. I think this is, it's just, you know, again, it takes a lot of extra work. And I really hope that all those who, are, who, who listen really do understand where, like, where, like, where it's coming from. Because you don't have to take this on. You have enough going on in your lives. And I think it's just a, it's a beautiful testament to you two as friends and as a couple. And I think it's just, 
I think God's blessing a lot of people through you all. So thank you. Thanks for doing what you're doing. I appreciate that, Thanks, Mark. Mark. I'm Gino. She's Julia. And we are Julia and Gino. Oh, so cheesy. I Thanks, can't everybody. <laughs>